Pleasure to be here this morning on Halloween. Perfect time to talk about this. Uh, and uh, I thank you all for coming out. Um, so just by way of a little bit more of an introduction, I, I started doing Lighthouse stuff in the 80s. A uh, big influence on me as a kid was Edward Rowe Snow, and I'm sure some of you remember him, the very popular historian who was from Winthrop, Mass originally, and later lived in Marshfield on the South Shore. Wrote many, many books, was always on TV and radio when I was growing up in the Boston area. Um, so, and he talked about uh, shipwrecks and pirates and treasure and all kinds of uh, interesting maritime subjects, including maritime ghosts and, of course, including lighthouses. So, that was a big influence on me. I started visiting lighthouses and photographing them in the 80s. I fell in love with their beauty. That's how a lot of people, I think, get in, interested in lighthouses. Uh, often they're in beautiful locations, of course. But as I uh, photographed them and visited them, I also started learning how interesting their history is. And for me, the most interesting part has always been the human history, the stories of lighthouse keepers and their families and so forth. Uh, so, and it's, a, it's now a way of life that's fading into history because uh, we have over 800 lighthouses in this country. More than half are still active aids to navigation, but they're all automated now. So traditional lighthouse keeping is really fading into to history. So I, I like trying to keep the stories alive. But what I'm talking about today is a very specific part of lighthouse lore. Uh, and it, I will uh, include some stories of uh, the keepers and so forth, uh, which figure into some of these stories. But today we're talking about New England's haunted lighthouses. And um, just a, a little bit more of an introduction before I get into specific stories here. But first of all, uh, I think it's no secret to anybody that lighthouses have very wide appeal. And everywhere you go, it seems like people love lighthouses. I would say that lighthouses, the, the lighthouse, is probably the most commonly used positive symbol or icon in our culture. You know, it's no accident that churches use them, schools use them, all kinds of businesses use them. Uh, they stand for hope and faith and guidance and perseverance and on and on, just all kinds of positive qualities. They were built for nothing but good reasons, to save lives and property. So it's completely appropriate that they're such popular positive symbols. Uh, but with that said, uh, I also like to say that lighthouses have a dark side. A little, little bit of a pun intended there, I think. But, um, you know, there's something about a lighthouse, especially the offshore ones, a lighthouse out on a rock in the distance. You see that light flashing at night, or you look at it during the day, and, and just imagine what it was like to, to live there, to be a keeper, or a family member of a keeper, living in an isolated place like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, just in general, there's kind of a mystery about it, those isolated lighthouses. Um, and no matter how you look at it, it was a scary existence. Whether you believe in ghost stories or not, living in a place like that all year round could be very scary, living through winter storms and so forth. It was a scary place. Um, so again, there's something about a light in the darkness, I think, that just kind of sparks our imaginations, the mystery of it and everything. And I have no doubt that some of the stories, some of the lighthouse ghost stories that a, appear in books and on the internet and so forth. Some of them can be chalked up to imagination. Living in a place like that, especially the remote lighthouses, you know, during winter storms and so forth, it would, they could lend themselves to imagining things, both that you see and or hear. Uh, the wind certainly can make strange noises in, inside a lighthouse, it gets in the cracks and so forth. Um, some lighthouses are made of cast iron that can kind of expand and contract and make creaking noises. There's all kinds of ways 
you know, noises can be produced at these places. I've read about uh, a family that moved to a lighthouse on the west coast where there were a lot of sea lions and the wife of the keeper wasn't used to that. And she woke up in the middle of the night, she thought one of her children was screaming and she ran and it was a sea lion making the sound. So, you know, animals, uh, seals, sea lions, uh, birds can make strange noises too. So I have no doubt that some of this can be chalked up to imagination. Also, some of these stories were told to other lighthouse keepers. They might have been told to a keeper's uh, family members and they get passed around. And we all know how stories get changed and twisted as they get passed from person to person and down from generation to generation. So some of the stories have been exaggerated. I have absolutely no doubt about that. But with that said, I, I like to call myself an open-minded skeptic. I, uh, you know, I think it's good to question these things, to try to figure out other explanations for, for odd things. But I also have, I've experienced a little bit myself that I'll talk about today, uh, some things that are hard to explain. And I've certainly got a lot of firsthand stories from people at lighthouses, uh, and I don't think they're crazy. I really don't. So I have to be an open-minded skeptic. That's really the way I see it. Um, the dark side of lighthouses uh, over the years, really for centuries, has appealed to many writers and filmmakers. And here are some covers of books and comic books uh, showing the inspiration of lighthouses in a lot of these stories. Stephen King, our most popular horror writer, uh, wrote Storm of the Century. A lighthouse figured heavily in that. Uh, there was a TV mini miniseries of that as well. Uh, one of my favorites, it's not a ghost story, but the foghorn on the upper left was a story written by Ray Bradbury, one of our great science fiction writers. Uh, and uh, it was made into the movie The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms in the 1950s. And there's a great scene in that movie uh, where the, the sea monster destroys a lighthouse with a couple of keepers in it. And uh, it's a really well done scene. I, I love that. Um, so again, uh, they have appealed to not just horror writers, but science fiction writers and, and so forth, for their, largely for the mystery of, of lighthouses. And it's not that well known, but Edgar Allan Poe, our, probably our greatest, some people might argue Stephen King, but Poe was certainly one of our, our greatest uh, writers of horror fiction. When Poe died, I believe he was only 40 years old when he died, he left behind a notebook with fragmentary notes about a lighthouse keeper. Uh, he was writing a story about a lighthouse keeper at an isolated lighthouse off the coast of England in the late 1700s. There's, it's, again, it's very fragmentary, so we don't really know where Poe was going to take the story. Uh, he wrote enough so we know that the, uh, the idea was that the keeper in the story wanted to be alone, so he got a job as a lighthouse keeper at an isolated place. Uh, but then weird things start to happen. He starts seeing beings of some kind, uh, and uh, it's not quite clear whether it's in his mind or whether it's really happening. So again, we'll never know. But a, uh, an editor named Christopher Conlon enlisted the help of a lot of science fiction and horror writers. This is about 20, I think close to 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, each of them took Poe's notes and composed their own story based around Poe's notes. And it's a really interesting book. I recommend it if you can find a used copy, Poe's Lighthouse. I will mention that a couple of the chapters are kind of adult in nature, so I'll warn you if you get it. You might want to skip those chapters if you're not interested. But it's a, it's a really good read. Uh, kind of hard to find, but I think if you go online, you can probably find a used copy of it. So I'm going to get into some specific lighthouse stories, starting with Boston Light, which is pretty, pretty local to here. And let me just say, uh, before I started a little while ago, somebody said, uh, I don't see Hospital Point Light up there. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that Hospital Point Light is not, not part of my presentation today. If anybody has any ghost stories related to Hospital Point Lighthouse, please tell me. I would love to hear about them. Uh, you can tell me afterwards or contact me later if you want. But it seems like if you dig deep enough, almost every lighthouse has at least one ghost story in there somewhere or something you know, some, uh, something along those lines. But I'm going to start with Boston Light. It's the oldest light station in America, established in September 1716. Uh, the the uh, General Court of Massachusetts, the colonial government, passed the Boston Light Bill. Uh, they built a 50-foot stone lighthouse. Boston, of course, was already a very busy port by that time. Uh, a lot of maritime traffic. 
And the uh, colony of Massachusetts hired the first lighthouse keeper on the continent. This was the first lighthouse on the North American continent. So they hired, <coughs> excuse me, hired a man named George Worthy Lake. He was 43 years old. He had a farm on Lovell's Island in Boston Harbor. And he moved to the island there. It's on an island called Little Brewster Island in outer Boston Harbor. It's actually closer to the town of Hull than it is to Boston. All the shipping traffic used to pass between Boston Light and Hull for many years. Uh, later they shifted the channel to the Broad Sound Channel to the north. But anyway, um, so George Worthy Lake, 43 years old, was hired to be the keeper, moved to the island with his wife and the two youngest of their five children, two daughters, and a family servant and two slaves. There was a male slave named Shadwell and a female slave named Dinah. Uh, and unfortunately, we know next to nothing about the slaves, sadly. Um, but George Worley Lake had a tough time as keeper. Uh, he tried doing extra things to make uh, money for his family. He was paid very little. He served as a harbor pilot. He would go out in a small boat and lead uh, ships into Boston Harbor. We got extra money for that. He tried having a flock of sheep for a while. Uh, that didn't work out so well. One day his flock of 59 sheep wandered out on a sand spit at low tide off of Little Brister Island. That always gets a groan when I say low tide. Um, you, know, and you can see what, of course, happened when the tide came in. That was the end of his flock of sheep. So uh, his sheep had very bad luck, and so did Worthy Lake. Uh, in November of 1718, Worthy Lake went into Boston with his wife and one of their two daughters and the family servant, not the slave, but a family servant, uh, went in on a Sunday. They attended church on Sunday, stayed overnight. Uh, he picked up his pay in Boston on Monday morning. They were traveling back to Boston Light in a sloop, probably similar to the one in this drawing. They picked up a family friend at Lovell's Island where Worthy Lake had his farm. They anchored off of Boston Light. Shadwell the slave paddled a canoe out to meet the landing party. There was not a storm going on from all reports. There, was no, there were no big waves or anything like that. One witness said that they were seen to be eating and drinking, but not to excess on the ship. Um, but anyway, uh, Shadwell the, the slave paddled the canoe out to the landing party. Six people crowded into the canoe. And as he was paddling back with the Worthy Lake's other daughter and a friend watching from the island, the canoe capsized and all six of them drowned. So this, to this day, is, uh, as far as I've been able to tell, is tied for the worst lighthouse tragedy in American history in terms of loss of life. There was a hurricane in the 1840s that killed six people at a lighthouse in Florida. But anyway, this is the triple gravestone of George, Ann, and Ruth Worthy Lake at the Copse Hill Burying Ground in Boston's North End. Probably some of you have walked around there. Uh, it's the, uh, kind of a typical gravestone of those days with the spooky death's heads, as they called them. Uh, and there's a few interesting footnotes. One is that Cotton Mather, the minister, the famous minister in Boston, preached a sermon about this. Benjamin Franklin, 12 years old at the time, living in Boston, wrote a poem called The Lighthouse Tragedy and sold copies on the streets of Boston. Later called it Wretched Stuff in his autobiography. Uh, and uh, a really interesting footnote is that the next keeper, Robert Saunders, went out to replace Worthy Lake. Within a couple of weeks, he also drowned. Uh, he was with two other men. They went out in a small boat to meet an incoming ship. Uh, and uh, the, the seas were reportedly rough. The boat capsized. Two of the three died. Uh, so people started to wonder if the island was cursed. So again, this is the very beginning of our American lighthouse history. And the first two keepers drowned. Uh, I always tell people lighthouse keeping wasn't as romantic as you think. If you look into the history of any offshore lighthouse, you're probably going to find some tragedies. So um, one, before I move on, one final positive footnote to this was that uh, the stonecutter, the young man who carved this gravestone, subsequently married the Worthy Lake's surviving daughter. So something good came out of it. Um, so this is a picture from the late 1800s of the keeper uh, in his uniform standing out there. I should make a, an important point here. The United States, uh, the new federal government, formed a lighthouse service in 1789. Before that, the light, lighthouses were managed by the individual colonies. So they formed a lighthouse service under the Treasury Department in 1789. Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, was in charge for a while. Uh, and later was under the Commerce Department. And then the Coast Guard took over management of lighthouses in 1939. So from 1789 to 1939, lighthouse keepers were civilian employees of the federal government. And it was Coast Guard after that. 
So uh, the guy in the picture there, the keeper, is wearing the old lighthouse service uniform, kind of look like a train conductor uniform. But I want to tell you a story about somebody who lived at Boston Light in the late 1940s. Uh, her name was Maisie Anderson, and her husband was Russell Anderson. He was a Coast Guard keeper for a couple of years there. Uh, so, and Maisie was the daughter. Whoops, <laughs> Maisie was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper in Maine, so she lived much of her life at lighthouses. Uh, and she later wrote an article for Yankee Magazine about living at lighthouses. She said that when they moved to Boston Light, sometimes she would be trying to sleep at night. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. She would be trying to sleep at night, and she would hear uh, what sounded like a young girl sobbing outside, just outside the house where, there, where she was trying to sleep. Uh, and she thought that was really strange because there was no little girl on the island. Uh, and she's, um, she checked, and there was nobody there. Uh, she said that on some occasions, not only did she hear the so sobbing, but she would hear the little girl repeating, Shadwell, Shadwell. She had no idea what that meant. Later, Maisie was researching the history of Boston Light, <clears throat> excuse me, and she discovered that the slave who was paddling the canoe when it capsized, uh, Worthy Lake's uh, slave, was named Shadwell. And so it was her belief that she was actually hearing kind of a replay of that event in 1718. As some of you know, if you've uh, you know read this about this kind of thing or watched the paranormal TV shows, some, it's considered one form of haunting, where it's almost like a, a tape replaying itself over and over, some event like that. So she thought she was hearing the voice of Worthy Lake's daughter crying out for Shadwell the slave. She also said that, uh, I believe it was on multiple occasions, she heard what she described as a man's maniacal laughter coming out of the boathouse. I have no idea what that, that might have been about, but she, she said that as well. So I'm going to jump to the 1980s. Uh, I lived in Winthrop for about 15 years, and I was helping to give tours at Boston Light in the late 80s through Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. And this guy, Dennis Dever, was the Coast Guard's officer in charge for a couple of years in the late 80s, so I got to know him pretty well. I interviewed him at the top of the lighthouse in the summer of 1989. I want to play you a quick clip of that. And I'm using my, this amazing little speaker here, so I hope you're going to be able to, to hear it okay. Let me try playing this. It's a nice environment uh, in the evening when the wind's howling, the snow's flying, and the, the sea's roaring against the, the rocks outside your window just to sit there uh, in the living room, maybe read a Edgar Allan Poe book or something like that. That's what I enjoy doing. <laughs> Dennis loved being a lighthouse keeper, and he loved a good storm out there. Uh, he also loved a good ghost story, and he told me, told me a few. One of the things he told me is that sometimes he would be working in the boathouse, you see here, be working on the boat, and he had a radio on. He would have a radio on while he was working. He would have it on a rock station. And as he was working, the radio would mysteriously change itself to a classical station. He would have to change it back. So he kept having this running battle with the radio. But he told me some other stories, too. And one of the most interesting was that one day, there's a picture I took from a helicopter about 20 years ago, by the way. That was a great day. Um, one day, Dennis was in the keeper's house that you see in the upper part of the, the picture there, and the kitchen window looked right out at the lighthouse. So he was doing, I think he was doing the dishes, and he was sure he saw a man standing in the top of the lighthouse, in the lantern room at the top of the lighthouse. He thought that was strange because the only other guy on the island was in the next room. Uh, somebody else I knew quite well, a young Coast Guardsman. Dennis checked, the, uh, James was, was right there in the next, next room. So Dennis went running over to the lighthouse and he said as he was approaching the lighthouse, he could still see somebody, a figure of a man in the lantern. He was sure of it, he told me he was absolutely sure. And he said to him, it looked like somebody in an old fashioned lighthouse keeper's uniform. So he went up the stairs, 76 stairs to the top and of course nobody was there. So he, he never figured that out. I heard similar stories from some of the other Coast Guard keepers uh, around that time as well, and in general they would blame it on old George, meaning George Worthy, like that first keeper. But I want to mention that uh, it looked like Dennis was going to be the last lighthouse keeper in the country. The Coast Guard had been automating the lights for some years by, by the late 80s, and the plan was to have Boston Light be the last lighthouse in the country to be automated and de-staffed, and that was supposed to happen in the year uh, 1990. Um, but people were afraid if they removed the keepers from Boston Light that the place would fall to ruin, that it might be neglected and possibly vandalized. 
So legislation was passed in October 89, it was led by Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, they put money in the Coast Guard budget to keep a presence there on the island. So for about, I think it was about 18 more years, they had Coast Guard keepers <laughs> living on the island. And then about 18, 19 years ago, they decided they had other things for that, those personnel to be doing. So they hired a civilian keeper, Sally Snowman, uh, I see you nodding. Some of you have probably seen Sally on TV. She's been on Chronicle and other TV shows. She's kind of a celebrity. She's the first woman keeper in the history of Boston Light, and she is the only official lighthouse keeper in the United States still employed by the federal government today. So her job is quite different from the traditional job. The light is on 24 hours a day. Technicians will take care of it if there's anything uh, to do with the equipment, uh, with the light or foghorn. Um, but Sally keeps an eye on everything. She supervises volunteers, Coast Guard Auxiliary, people they call watchstanders who spend shifts out there. And she used to run tours, but they haven't had tours in a few years now because the pier was basically destroyed in storms a few years ago. So there haven't been tours out there in a while. But anyway, uh, I should mention Sally's standing by the beautiful old second order Fresnel lens in the lighthouse there. Some of you sure know what Fresnel lenses are. Beautiful lenses mostly made in France. Uh, invented in the 1820s with multiple glass prisms that magnify and focus the light. Second order is the second from the largest kind that they made. This rotates and creates a, f a flash every 10 seconds. So a beautiful, beautiful lens from 1859, still in place there. But anyway, Sally gets into the role. She wears these period dresses and likes to wave a hanky to passing ships. <laughs> so she gets into it. Anyway, so she told me some stories. She, has never, she told me that she has never experienced anything she would consider you know, paranormal or anything like that. But she said that some of the watch standards that she supervises have told her interesting stories. And she said it's pretty common that they, they say they see things there. Uh, one of the most common is that they see a woman standing at the top of the lighthouse uh, around dusk or a bit after that. Also, they see her walking around on the island, on the paths on the island. She's usually described as having long flowing hair and like a white nightgown type of attire. Uh, and I'm not judging, I'm not saying they don't see that, but I have to say it's kind of a cliche ghost, you know, the, the woman in, in white with the long, long flowing hair, but that doesn't mean they don't see it. But anyway, um, she, one of the most interesting stories Sally, Sally told me is that one of the watchstanders was in the keeper's house one night during a rainstorm and the house was, the cellar was fr prone to flooding. So there were, this person was getting up periodically and checking the basement for flooding. And there's also a stairway to the second floor close to the couch. So one of the times the person got up, suddenly they saw a woman coming down the stairs and there was no woman upstairs, so they were quite surprised. And there, uh, this person said that their eyes met for a few seconds and then she disappeared. And Sally said this person who told her this was completely serious about it and was sure of what they had seen. I spent a night on the couch in the keeper's house uh, about three or four years ago at Sally's invitation. I, didn't, I was very aware of that staircase during the night, but I didn't see anybody coming down. Uh, the scariest thing for me was the gulls that kept me awake most of the night. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty noisy there. I was surprised they, they kept squawking all night. So I'm going to move on. I want to jump down to southern New England. And this lighthouse, first of all, architecturally, this is, I think, one of the most amazing lighthouses anywhere. I'm not even sure that a lot of people would identify that as a lighthouse, but it is. Uh, it's at the mouth of the Thames, as they pronounce it down there, the Thames River between Groton and New London, Connecticut. Uh, it was built in 1909, so it was one of the last lighthouses in the country built by the federal government. Uh, and they say it was built in such an unusual and beautiful style to be in keeping with the, the beautiful homes on shore in that area, on both sides of the, the river. I think the people had some political clout. But anyway, it's uh, just uh, magnificent architecturally. It's this brick mansion with the lantern on the roof. And keepers lived there with their families for many years. Uh, it became, under the Coast Guard, it became males only. And it was, it was one of the last ones to be automated in, I think it was 86. But here's an early postcard of it from the early 1900s. I don't know if you can see it, but it says Southwest Ledge Light, New London. They called it Southwest Ledge Light at first, but there's another Southwest Ledge Lighthouse in New Haven, Connecticut. So they started calling this New London Ledge instead. There's a really famous ghost story here. This is probably the most famous New England ghost story. And there is, uh, you know, people have said they've experienced all kinds of strange things there. And this one has kind of a backstory to explain the hauntings. I'm going to tell you the 
the backstory without any guarantee that it's a true story. It's one of those stories that uh, starts with they say, and that's probably the most important part of it. So I'm gonna tell you the story as it's usually told. They say that in the 1930s, there was a keeper there named uh, Ernie. Uh, and I don't know his last name, but Ernie uh, was the keeper and has lived there with his wife. And his wife, uh, after living there a while, became very bored, which isn't all that hard to imagine. Although I will say wives of keepers in general did a tremendous amount of the work, usually for no, no pay. But so his wife became very bored. Uh, Ernie left the lighthouse to get supplies one afternoon, uh, was gone for a few hours, and came back to find a note left by his wife. And the note said that she had run away with the captain of the Block Island Ferry, <laughs> which goes by there at least a couple of times a day on its way from New London to Block Island, Rhode Island. Uh, they, they say that poor Ernie was distraught, that he went to the roof of the lighthouse and dove off to his death. And they say that they found a note left behind by Ernie saying that because of what his wife had done to him, he would uh, curse the place and haunt it forevermore, basically. Some versions of, the versions of the story say that he drank himself stupid and fell off the roof to his death. But usually they say he, he jumped off, committed suicide. Uh, and ever since then, people have reported strange happenings. During the Coast Guard era, like in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of newspaper articles describing stories of what the Coast Guard personnel were experiencing there or what they said they experienced there. You know, I wasn't there, so I can't, can't verify these. But um, the, one of the most common things was they would say the light itself was very erratic, that it would come, the light, the navigational light in the lighthouse would come on and off for no apparent reason, and also the foghorn, the modern electronic foghorn, it would just go on and off for no reason. They were supposed to, it was only supposed to happen when they actually turned it on. Their TV also, they said, would come on and off for, for no, no reason. Sounds to me like maybe an electrical problem in the place. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was one of the most common things. And, but also, you know, all these stories about uh, furniture being rearranged when nobody was, was looking and, uh, and the decks would swab themselves, one story said. That's a, maybe just a little far-fetched. Uh, and uh, I know it was said, uh, I've seen it in some, some sources, that uh, only women would see the ghost of Ernie and they would see him only in mirrors, so they said. So there's a lot of these stories, and I will tell you that about probably close to 20 years ago now, I was talking to a man who was involved with the nonprofit that was taking care of this lighthouse, the New London Ledge Lighthouse Foundation, and he told me that he and other volunteers had weird, weird experiences out there. He said one time he was in the basement working on something. Uh, it might have been the furnace he was working on. He, was like, he said he was like crouched down and, and working on something. And he said suddenly behind him, uh, he heard what he was sure was a woman like sort of uh, clearing her throat and kind of murmuring something, but he couldn't make out any words, but she, he said she cleared her throat. And he said he knew there was a woman like right behind him and he turned around and nobody was there. And he absolutely insisted, he wasn't imagining things. So, you know, these, there's a lot of these stories over the years and a number of the paranormal uh, investigation groups have done investigations, a number of the TV shows have been out there, Ghost Hunters on TV were there, uh, a show called Most Haunted, an English group of ghost hunters, a show that was on for many years. Uh, they were there. I believe there's a YouTube video of the Most Haunted investigation. They had uh, one of the guys in the group whistled a tune in the, in the basement. They were all in the basement. He whistled uh, a few notes and it seemed like it, somebody repeated that from somewhere else in the lighthouse and they swore that there was nobody upstairs where it came from. And, there was, and the lights went on and off by themselves. Some other things happened. So I got to go out in uh, July 2006 with the Paranormal Investigation Group and it was also shot as part of a TV show called American Builder. The Comca Comcast Cable used to produce the show American Builder. It was on every day for years. I don't know if anybody remembers it. It was like a home improvement kind of show, kind of like uh, this old house or something. And they decided to do a, uh, a Halloween special on the Haunted Lighthouse, New London Ledge. So I went out with New England Ghost Project uh, several members and the TV crew and on the left pic in the left picture you see the guy on the right you see him almost from behind there that's Ron Kolek K 
K-O-L-E-K. He started New England Ghost Project quite a few years ago now, lives in Dracut, Mass. He's written a couple of books on the paranormal and has a couple of radio shows and so forth. Uh, the woman with the blonde hair in both of the pictures, curly blonde hair, is Maureen Wood. She is a psychic medium or sometimes referred to as a trance medium because it appears that during uh, these, these uh, investigations a lot of times she'll go into a trance and start speaking as if she's somebody else. And I, I've always tended to be very skeptical of those kinds of things, but I'll tell you that I've taken part in several investigations with Maureen and it's really interesting. She's co she comes up with things that are hard to explain and I know she's sincere. I know her well enough to know she's not making this stuff up. She claims to be a fifth generation psychic and her daughter seems to have abilities as well. So, uh, and the woman with the long hair in these pictures, uh, or, yeah, is uh, Karen Mossy and she was the EVP expert for New England Ghost Project at that time. If you watch the paranormal TV shows, you know what EVPs are, but I'll explain it more in a, in a minute. And the young guy with the maroon baseball cap there was uh, named Jimmy, and I can't remember his last name, but he was one of the hosts of the American Builder Show, so he was out there with us to kind of represent the show. Uh, so early in the evening, they used the Ouija board, and Ron brought that out, or Ouija, as some people sometimes pronounce it, um, and uh, I know some people think those are evil, that it's like kind of inviting trouble when you use them. Uh, Ron doesn't think that, he thinks it's just another tool you can use, and you get some interest, interesting results, but not much happened with that. Uh, a few of them are sitting on the floor, as you can see there. Not much, not much happened with the Ouija board. So then, I think it was six of them. I was not one of the six. I was standing off to the side. Six people were sitting on the floor holding hands, kind of like a seance, and just, you know, with their eyes closed, just kind of concentrating. And Maureen suddenly said, there's somebody here. And her voice kind of deepened. She, she turned to Ron, and she opened her eyes, and she, I swear she looked really angry and I, I thought when I saw the look on her face, I thought Maureen's not home right now. This is like somebody else. And she said, you lie to Ron. And uh, she actually hit him hard on the arm, she said, you lie. Uh, and then she said, oh, my head, and she grabbed her head and you know, it was like moaning and she fell over backwards. Uh, and Ron kind of grabbed her and said, it's okay, Maureen, you know, come, come back, it's okay. Uh, and after maybe a minute or two, she, she was okay. She kind of came, came out of it. And, uh, but she, she re a lot of times she bl blanks out and she doesn't even remember what she does when she, she's in a trance. But in this case, she pretty much remembered the, the basic, uh, you know, what she was seeing. And she talked about it later. This is early in the morning. We're waiting for a boat to pick us up. Around, I think it was around 5 a.m., we all went into different rooms and tried to sleep for a while, I, but there was, there was no furniture at that time, so it was just bare wood floors. I tried to sleep in one of the rooms, and as the light was coming in, I could see spiders all over the wall. So, <laughs> talk about scary, that was pretty scary. Um, so they're waiting for the boat to, you can see Ron and Maureen look pretty tired here. Uh, and what Maureen said was that what she took away from the experience was that she said, uh, this is a very angry male spirit here, she said, he's not a lighthouse keeper, he was a construction worker. And he was with a crew out there, and the other workers locked him out on the roof as a prank, and he fell off the roof to his death, landed on his head, that's why she was holding her head. Uh, so, uh, it was an interesting story. Is it true? I have no way of knowing. But I will tell you, uh, you know, the usual story that's told is about Ernie the lighthouse keeper. There's no record of a keeper named Ernie, no record of a keeper ever committing suicide or anything like that. So I think it was a made up story. But Maureen's alternate story of a construction worker dying makes more sense and it's actually more believable. She says his death was covered up, so he's angry. And also uh, everybody thinks it was a lighthouse keeper. Everybody has the story wrong, so he's angry about that. Uh, so it's actually, you know, there's no proof of it, but it's, a, it's an interesting alternate story and actually more believable than the usual story. So I mentioned EVPs, uh, Karen Mossy was the EVP person for the group at that time. Stands for Electronic Voice Phenomena, and the idea is that, uh, it goes back to the early days of sound recording, even Thomas Edison was interested in this sort of thing. Uh, and the idea is that you make a recording, of course they used to use tape recorders or whatever, now it's usually small digital recorders, and you'll, let, you'll just record an area for a while, sometimes ask questions into the recorder, 
And the idea is that nothing is heard audibly at the time. Uh, things on the recording are only heard in playback later. So, uh, and I've been present with some of these have been recorded where nothing is heard and then it's played back immediately after and you hear a voice on there. So it's pretty interesting. How is it done? I have no idea. So there's a lot of theories about, uh, you know, these entities or whatever being able to imprint on, the, on a recording, but I don't know how that might happen. Your guess is as good as mine. But um, here's one that Karen Mossy recorded in the lighthouse very late at night. Uh, I believe she was inside. I think it was after midnight. And you're going to hear her voice first say, are you here, yes or no? And she seems to get a reply. Are you here, yes or no? This is a little soft. Let me play it again, and I'll hold it to the microphone. Are you here, yes or no? Could you hear that? It sounds like yes to me, but it's kind of fuzzy. There are class A, B, C, D EVPs. That might be about a class B, but it certainly sounds like yes. This next one she recorded out on the deck at the top of the stairs. I think it was like 2 AM. Uh, she decided to do some recording there because a previous uh, woman investigator years before had got an interesting photograph of what looked like a cloud, sort of, she said, ectoplasm or something something paranormal at the top of those stairs. So Karen was there about 2 a.m. She got this sound, and she thinks it's a voice saying, help me, I'm cold. Uh, and uh, let me play it for you. Can you hear that? The, I think the I'm cold part is more clear. So, you know, there's no proof that that's what it says. That's Karen's interpretation, and it, it does kind of sound like that. To hear EVPs properly, you should use head, headphones. Uh, and they are, you know, even the best ones are somewhat usually open to interpretation. And what this might mean, I don't know. There's also uh, stories of, that there was a sailboat wreck near the lighthouse in its early days and that a family was all died. Uh, there's no record of that, so I don't know if it's true. But some people attribute some of these odd happenings to that as well. There's Ernie. <laughs> Uh, the lighthouse is now owned by the New London Maritime Society. They actually own three lighthouses. They do run tours there sometimes in summer. It's worth going if you ever have a chance. I've been, been inside a couple, of, obviously this time, but a couple other times too. And uh, I don't know if he's still out there. This was a while ago, but I know for a while sometimes he'd be looking out the window and you'd go by in a boat and you'd see Ernie looking at you from, from the lighthouse. So I'm going to jump up to Midcoast, Maine here. Owl's Head Light has been called the most haunted lighthouse in America. Uh, Coastal Living Magazine called it that a few years ago. And I'll tell you that I've known a lot of people who live there over the years, and almost every one of them has interesting stories about it. It is now the headquarters of the American Lighthouse Foundation, the Keeper's House. Uh, there's a museum and shop in there run by my good friend Bob Trapani, the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation, and his wife, Anne. And I, I'll say that they ha they're two of the few people who spent a lot of time there that have not told me any stories, but they are very skeptical about this stuff. And I feel that if, if anything did happen, they probably wouldn't tell me anyway. So, and they're only there during the day. They don't live there at night. Not that these things have to happen at night. There's absolutely no rule about that. But they tend to be noticed more at night, I think, is what happens. But as you can see, there's a keeper's house on lower ground there. By the way, this place was established in 1825. Lighthouse was rebuilt in 1852. It's a very old light station. You have the keeper's house and then a, a walkway and a stairway going up to the lighthouse tower. It's a short brick tower, but it, light is 100 feet above the water at the entrance to Rockland Harbor on Penobscot Bay in Midcoast, Maine. Very beautiful place. And there's an old picture of it showing that uh, walkway and stairway. And the guy on the right was a keeper. He was there in the 40s. His name was uh, George Woodward. And uh, he's trimming the wick of the kerosene lamp there. That was a Coast Guard publicity picture. I'm not saying that he haunts the place, but I will say that this is one of many lighthouse ghost stories where it seems to point to the idea of a keeper of the past still haunting or you know, still keeping watch at the place years after their death. So I'm just showing him as an example of a keeper there. So I first visited Owl's Head Light in 1988. And believe it or not, that's me on the far left in the picture, in the blue shirt and the tan pants, just a few uh, years, a few hairs ago. Um, and with me is Mac Rouse, Malcolm Rouse, 
who was the last Coast Guard keeper of the light. They were in the process of automating it at that time, and they uh, finished automating it and removed him from there a short time later. So I interviewed him at the time with my VHS camcorder, and I thought we were done, but then he said, uh, and you know the place is haunted, right? And uh, I said, no, tell me about it. So he, and that, that's actually happened to me a number of times. I've been on the phone with ex-lighthouse keepers and be about to hang up and they'll say, you know the place was haunted, right? <laughs> that's happened several times. But anyway, so, um, so Mac told me that he had a young son who on numerous occasions would see an old woman sitting in the chair in the kitchen, in a chair in the kitchen, even though nobody was there, uh, and insisted that there was somebody there. He said his wife experienced odd things in the house, although I, I don't think I ever got the particulars of that. And Mac is one of a number of people who reported a really weird thing that sometimes there'd be a snowfall uh, and they would go outside after a snowfall and there would be footprints on the walkway and going up the walkway and going up the stairs to the door of the lighthouse and just ending at the door of the lighthouse. The footprints wouldn't come across the grounds, across the yard at all. They just started on the walkway and ended at the lighthouse door, which did not make a lot of sense. So he couldn't figure that out. I know there are some versions of it that will say the door would be opened and it appeared that the, this uh, ghost or whatever uh, polished the lens. That I'm not too sure about. He didn't tell me that. I've seen that in books. but. Um, so uh, after I talked to Mac Rouse, I talked to a guy named John Norton. He was the keeper at Owl's Head in, in the Coast Guard uh, in the early 1980s. And he told me that one night he was trying to sleep in a keeper's house upstairs uh, in his bedroom. And he said, he told me he knew he was wide awake. There's no way he was sleeping or dreaming when this happened. And he said there was the face of an old man looking at him in the room. And uh, after a few seconds, it disappeared. And he told me, this is a, like a gruff Mainer. He had a gigantic beard. And um, he was not going to make up stories like this. He insisted that he saw this. He wasn't dreaming or anything. After him, there was a couple named German, G-E-R-M-A-N-N, -N, Andy and Denise. Um, they had a number of experiences. One of the most interesting <clears throat> excuse me, was one night they had already gone to bed. But Andy realized he had to go outside and take care of something. So he told Denise, I'll be back in a few minutes. He left. While Denise is in the bed by herself, she said that she saw what looked like the indentation of a person moving around in the bed next to her. Now, most of these stories to me are more interesting than scary. That one's kind of scary to me. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty strange. And later, Andy told her that when he left the room, he saw what looked like a gray, smoky figure move from the hallway through the wall into the bedroom. And the timing of that seemed to coincide with what happened to her. Now, why he didn't tell her about that right when he first saw it, I'm not so sure. But maybe he wasn't sure he really saw it. He was, thought, was wondering if he was imagining things. But, so that was pretty interesting. When the Germans were going to leave, the next family that came in was the Grahams, you see in the picture on the right here, Gerard Graham. Coast Guard uh, keeper and his wife, Debbie, and their little daughter, Claire. The Germans told them the house is haunted. They said there's one upstairs bedroom. It's the most haunted part of the house. You don't want to use that. They laughed. They thought it was hilarious. They made that one room their daughter, Claire's bedroom. <laughs> and they said that the entire time they lived there, and I think Claire still remembers it today, she had an imaginary, what they said, they described as an imaginary friend, but maybe not so imaginary. Uh, it was an old sea captain who would talk to her. Uh, one night, uh, late at night, Debbie and Gerard were asleep in their bedroom, and three-year-old Claire came into the room, woke them up, and said, Fog's coming in, time to put the horn on. They had no idea where she got that. They had never talked about anything remotely like that to her, so they figured the old sea captain told her to say that. So Debbie, it's another case where, in the early 2000s, Debbie emailed me about stories about life at Owl's Head. And she, the last thing she said was, you know the place is haunted, right? <laughs> in 2002, I got to take part in a Travel Channel documentary, Haunted Lighthouses of America. It's been shown many, many times over the years. I don't think they're showing it anymore. But I was interviewed for it. Uh, and I got to spend a week with the crew. I got a production assistant credit, too. But I also got to play the lighthouse ghost in some scenes. This is not me in this picture. But I did get to wear the uniform in a couple of scenes in the movie. That was a lot of fun. You see the mysterious keeper at the top of Owl's Head Light looking out to sea from behind. That's, that's me if you ever see it. But the guy in this picture uh, was the 
father-in-law of the Coast Guard officer living there in the house at that time. After they automated the light and removed the keeper, the Coast Guard for some years continued using the house for housing for a Coast Guard family. He was the commander of a local Coast Guard cutter. Uh, and uh, his, the, the officer was not there the night we were filming there, but his wife was there and her father was there, and that's her father. They put the uniform on him and he kind of stood in for the lighthouse ghost in a couple of, couple of scenes. Um, he said that uh, one night he was trying to sleep in, uh, up, upstairs in the house and he said his bed started vibrating like crazy. And he said there was not a storm, nothing else was vibrating except his bed. And he laughed, he thought that was funny. I don't know if I would have, would have thought it was so funny. But his daughter, the officer's uh, wife, was kind of nervous about the whole thing and she, she had a small child. She said that she would see uh, what she described as swirling lights in the upstairs bedroom uh, when there was absolutely no source of that light and she couldn't figure that out. So she was a little nervous about the whole thing. Um, this picture was taken by a guy named Bob D'Amato. I did a presentation at least 10 years ago now and he was in the audience and he emailed me the picture afterwards. He's from Connecticut. I later had dinner with him. I know that he's sincere. I know that he didn't Photoshop this picture or anything. He was quite surprised that he got what he got. And you probably can't see it very well here, but I'm gonna show, I'm gonna zoom in on it in a minute. Um, the interesting part of the picture is to the right of the flagpole in front of the fence there. So this is standing by the lighthouse. He had the camera on a tripod. He's looking out into Penobscot Bay. He's got the oil house where the keeper used to store kerosene, the little brick building there got the flag and you can see it was a long exposure of several seconds you can see the flag blurred in the picture but again the interesting part is just to the right of the flagpole I don't know if you can see it there but let me show you what it looks like if you zoom in right here so uh, Bob D'Amato said that he had a friend with him but the friend was behind him when he took the picture there was nobody else there um, and when he looked at his pictures after he got home he uh, he couldn't believe what he got here uh, and again, I am absolutely sure he's sincere about it, that he didn't fake this. Uh, the interesting thing is that if it was a long exposure, so if, he said there was absolutely nobody there but his friend who was behind him, but if there was somebody there, if you, know, if you take an exposure for a few seconds, the edges of it are gonna be kind of blurred. The edges of this, what looked like a figure standing there, are actually pretty sharp, but you can see right through it, um, which is really strange. Uh, it looks like a man, although sometimes I thought, could it be a woman, uh, but it looks like uh, pants. If it's a, you know, something from a long time ago, it's probably a man, but, uh, you know, I don't have any explanation for it. Other, all I can say is it's a really interesting picture, uh, and that's about all, I, <laughs> that's about as far as I can go. So your interpretation is as good as mine, certainly. So moving down the coast to uh, Seguin Light, this is a very beautiful light station at the mouth of the Kennebec River. Maybe some of you have been to Popham Beach near there. You can look out from the beach and you can see this lighthouse in the distance. Uh, it's one of the highest lights in New England. About, the light is about 200 feet above the water. Here's a picture so you can see how high it is. Um, and it's got a first order, beautiful first order Fresnel lens, the only one still in use in northern New England. Uh, cared for by a nonprofit, the Friends of Seguin Island. Uh, and it has another one of the most famous lighthouse ghost stories of all time. And this is another they say story, the story that's usually used to explain it, okay? I'm going to show you an old postcard here. So they say, they say that in the mid 1800s, a keeper was living there with his wife. And again, the wife became very bored. That's a common theme. Uh, and uh, the, the keeper's wife asked him for a piano. She wanted a piano to help pass the time. So he bought his wife a piano. A uh, crew came out in a schooner and carried the piano up the steep path to the keeper's house, put it in there. Uh, but along with the piano, she only got one piece of sheet music, a popular song of the day. So she, she quickly learned how to play that song, but it's all she knew. So she would play that song over and over and over and over and over and over. Uh, you get the idea, until it drove her husband insane uh, they say he grabbed an axe they had for chopping firewood, proceeded to chop up the piano, and proceeded to murder his wife and kill himself. So the story goes. Uh, and they say that ever since then, if you're on Seguin Island on a quiet day you, and you listen really carefully, you're probably going to hear this pretty piano music drifting in the breeze, that same song playing over and over. Uh, so it's a very commonly told story. It's in a lot of books on lighthouse ghost stories. 
I will say that there's no record of a murder-suicide on the island. If, if something like that had happened uh, to you know, these uh, government employee like that, there'd be some sort of record of it. Nobody's ever produced a newspaper story or anything else. So I don't think it took place, at least not exactly the way that story is told. But in any case, uh, many, many people have reported the music on the island. And uh, about uh, more than 10 years ago now, I was on a Coast Guard boat all day, and a bunch of us were inspecting some lighthouses that the government was going to be transferring to new owners. There was a woman on the boat from the General Services, Services Administration, the GSA in Boston. She told me that about a week before, she had been on Seguin Island, and she said that uh, she's walking around by herself. She had never heard the ghost story, never heard about the piano or any of that. She heard pretty piano music floating in the breeze. She went to the caretaker and she said, that music was really beautiful. Who was playing the piano? And he said, there's no piano here. Nobody was playing any music, so you must have heard the ghost. She described the music as sounding like a memory, which is a very interesting way to describe music. Um, and she was absolutely sure that she heard it. It wasn't that she thought she may have heard it. She told me she heard piano music. People say, uh, you know, lobstermen passing by on their boats will hear it and so forth. So it's a very common story. There's other stories about uh, people hearing uh, a man coughing inside the lighthouse tower when nobody is there, hearing footsteps going up and down the stairs and so forth. So there's, there's other stories as well, but the piano story is the one you usually hear. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there's no record of it, but some people say that it did actually happen on a nearby island, Pond Island, where there's also a lighthouse. I've read that uh, some, there was a, a lot of local people said it actually happened on Pond Island. Uh, and maybe the story somehow got transferred to Seguin, although I don't know why you would hear the piano music on Seguin. But uh, my feeling is there may be a grain of truth in there somewhere, uh, but certainly people have heard the music out there. So I'm moving down the coast here to go, just got a couple more lighthouses to tell you about. Goat Island Light is in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, and by the way, there's no shortage of these stories, so I could go on all day if you let me, but I'm just going to talk about a couple more. Um, Go to Island Light is in Kenny Bunkport, actually in the Cape Porpoise Village, which is part of Kenny Bunkport. Uh, it's a, another really old light station going back to the 1830s at the entrance to Cape Porpoise Harbor. Maybe some of you have been there. You drive to the end of the road, the Cape Pier Chowder House is there. You can look out and see the lighthouse. Uh, beautiful little harbor with lobster boats. Um, you see the Keeper's House, short brick tower attached to the, the I mean, the, uh, the house, the Keeper's House attached by a, sh a short uh, covered walkway to the uh, the short brick lighthouse there. Here's an early postcard of it from the early 1900s. So this lighthouse today, this light station, along with a lot of the other islands and land around there, is owned by the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust. And they take great care of it. They conserve a lot of the land around there. They do a great job as the manager of the lighthouse. Uh, the guy on the upper left is Scott Dombrowski. I've known him for more than 25 years. He is the, the chief caretaker for Goat Island. Uh, back in the 90s, he and his wife and two young sons, they're not that young anymore, and they're about six foot five, but um, they lived on the island in the summers, and they were from Marblehead, Mass. Uh, Scott was from Marblehead, Mass, moved up to Kenny Bunkport, and around the same time, his childhood friend, Dick Curtis, the guy on the right, also moved from Marblehead to Kenny Bunkport. So Scott became the summer caretaker for the lighthouse. Dick became the winter caretaker. Uh, and Dick was a single guy, lived with a couple of dogs, uh, and uh, was, was also a lobsterman, really well-known, well-liked guy in the area. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, May of 2002, Dick was on shore at Cape Porpoise Harbor there talking to people, and he said he was going to go out for a boat ride. He lived with two dogs on the island. He had his two dogs with him, and I think he had a third dog, somebody else's dog as well said they were going to go out for a ride around the island at sunset. He left, and by the next morning, people realized he had never come back. So they sent a search party out. This was on the news that they were looking for him. Uh, eventually, they found his boat overturned on the far side of the island, the ocean side, which is, tends to be very rough. They eventually found his body. Uh, he drowned. Uh, nobody knows exactly what happened, but a lot of people thought his dogs probably got in trouble in the water, and he was trying to save them. And, wearing heavy clothes and the water was cold, etc., and he didn't make it. Uh, big news at the time, they had a big memorial service for him, attended by many, many people. Again, very popular guy, he was 52 years old. Um, 
And not long after that, I was on the island with Scott. We we're standing at the top of the lighthouse. And Scott said to me, you know, Dick and I used to joke that after we die, we'll haunt this place. Uh, and to this day, Scott feels really strongly that his friend Dick's presence is there. And to me, this is one of the most interesting of these stories because it's based on something that happened more recently that we know is a true story. And, uh, you know, Scott and other people have experienced a lot of things out there. Um, I'll tell you probably the most interesting story that Scott has told me. This was in the early 2000s, and so I'm sure a lot of you know that the uh, Bush family has their estate at Walker's Point in Kennebunkport. Uh, George H.W. Bush and Barbara spent summers there for many, many years. It goes back to, uh, to George H.W. Bush's grandfather. But um, from Walker's Point, you can see Goat Island Lighthouse and vice versa. In fact, Secret Service lived at Goat Island Lighthouse the last couple of years of George H.W. Bush's presidency. But in the early 2000s, when George W. Bush was president, uh, there was going to be a meeting at Walker's Point between George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin from Russia. We're not going to, I'm sure we're not going to see that again. But so he, uh, Putin actually came over. Scott knew this was happening. And he said that D Dick, his friend, Dick Curtis, loved flags. So partly in Dick's memory, in his honor, Scott decided to fly a Russian flag next to the American flag as a way of t telling people we need to work together with the Russians. Of course, that's bad, bad flag etiquette. You're not supposed to fly a foreign flag next to the American flag. But he was trying to make a statement. So he said it was at the top of the lighthouse. He got uh, the Russian flag set up the way he wanted it next to the American flag. He said it took him a while, had to fiddle with it and get it just right. And when he finished, he said, I'll, he was standing next to the fog horn on the top of the lighthouse, this electronic fog horn that had a sensor. It was only supposed to go on when it was foggy. This was on a bright, sunny day. He got the flags in place, and he said out loud, how do you like that, Dickie? Meaning his friend Dick Curtis. How do you like that, Dickie? Um, um. The horn started sounding right then, out of the blue. And what's really interesting is that not too long before that, a woman had come out to the island and told Scott that she was a psychic. And she said, your friend will make himself known by electronic means. <laughs> and Scott said that after that, every time he would be walking around the island, he would walk near the lighthouse. On a sunny day, the horn would blast once. And he really felt that was Dick saying hi to him. Uh, and he said that, that equipment never worked right after that until like two years later when the Coast Guard replaced all the equipment. Um, so there's other stories too, but that's my favorite. Um, I spent a night with New England Ghost Project about 10 years ago at Goat Island. There was a, a different medium uh, with the group named Leslie Marden. She's really interesting, too. She wrote a, her, her life story, a book called uh, Medium Rare, which I, I love the title. But uh, Leslie, when we first, we first went in the keeper's house, and then Leslie didn't know anything about the place. In general, you know, the people like her, they don't want to be told anything in advance. She walked into the house and she picked up a pair of binoculars off the table and she, she, she was like clutching them and she said, these belong to somebody who loved this place so much. And she said, I see a tall man with a mustache, which certainly described Dick. Uh, later we were upstairs in a, the room that had been Dick's bedroom upstairs. And again, nobody had said his name, nobody had talked about uh, his death or anything. And she turned to Scott and she said, oh, we're talking about your friend Dickie here, aren't we? And that was like out of the blue, and nobody called him Dickie except Scott, so it was really interesting. And Leslie said he's still very much here because he loves this place, so his presence is here. And I like to think that's the case. So the last lighthouse I want to tell you about is my home base. I live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The lighthouse is actually in Newcastle, a little town next to Portsmouth. It's only like one square mile attached by a couple of bridges to Portsmouth. And uh, it's a very historic light station. It goes back to 1771. It was the first lighthouse established north of Boston in the colonies. But it's been rebuilt twice. This cast iron tower you see here was built in 1878. It's on a Coast Guard station, Coast Guard Station, Portsmouth Harbor. It's also, uh, also on the station is Fort Constitution. You see the granite wall there. That's part of the Civil War era wall of Fort Constitution. There are inner walls from 1808. Tremendous history at this place. I could, I could go on all day about all the, the history of the fort and the lighthouse. But in this picture on the other side of the fort wall, you see the keeper's house where the keepers used to live. That's been used in more recent years uh, as for offices for the Coast Guard. They also have a, a much larger building on the station. Um, so I've been involved with this for, for more than 20 years now. 
I want to tell you about uh, Joshua Card, who was the longest serving keeper back in the lighthouse service days. He was keeper from 1874 to 1909, 35 years. He was a local guy from Newcastle, went to sea on a fishing boat when he was 12 years old, traveled all over the place as a fisherman, came back and worked at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard for a while, became a lighthouse keeper in his 40s, first at Boone Island Light, which is like eight miles off of southern Maine, which if I, I, I think I'm gonna do a part two to this talk, by the way, Boone Island's gonna be in that. There's some stories there. But he was at Boone Island for a few years. Once uh, the island was underwater in a storm and they had to go up in the lighthouse tower for safety, I think that's when his wife decided they were gonna move. So he took the job at Portsmouth Harbor in 1874, his hometown lighthouse. He was extremely well liked and respected in the, in the area. People would visit there in the summer and he loved to show people around. They say he knew all the history of the area and the history of the lighthouse. Loved showing people his light station and was the lighthouse service thought of him as one of the best keepers in the country. Um, in this picture, he's wearing the lighthouse uh, service uniform had the letter K on the lapels. You can kind of see there's something on the lapels there. Letter K indicated that he was the principal keeper of that station. But they say if people, if he was showing people around and they asked him, what does that K stand for? He would say, why captain, of course. So I think he was a wise guy. I think he knew how to spell, but I think he liked being called captain. It was a sign of respect. Lighthouse keepers were often called captain. He, was, he would have been known as Captain Card. He was keeper until he was 86 years old. He had a stroke. He had to retire. I'm sure he didn't want to. But he retired in 1909, and uh, he died two years later at his, uh, his daughter's home in Newburyport. So I'm going to refer back to him in a minute. I just wanted to give you some background. And I also want to give you a little background on Elson and Connie Small. Uh, they came in the 40s in 1946. It was at the tail end of a 28-year career at Lighthouses. Elson was in the Lighthouse Service. He joined the Coast Guard when they took over. So he's in a Coast Guard uniform in these pictures at Portsmouth Harbor. Before they moved there, he, Elson and Connie were only on islands off the main coast. This was the first place where they could drive to their home, first place that had electricity, which they were thrilled about. I knew Connie late in her life, and she told me they went on an electric binge when they moved in there. Uh, and, uh, but she said it felt weird to push a button to make the light come on in the lighthouse because it was too easy. They, they didn't, weren't putting themselves into it anymore. So that was, that was kind of the end of uh, traditional lighthouse keeping. But um, I should mention Connie at the age of 85 uh, wrote a book called The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, which is a classic book. If you want to read about life at lighthouses, read The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife by Connie Small. I very highly recommend it. So uh, they left in 1948. And uh, as I said, I knew Connie late in her life. I interviewed her when she was 96. She lived to be 103. She died in early 2005 at 103. The picture on the right, uh, she's 102 in that picture on the right. Uh, that's me on the, the far right with uh, Joanne and Paul, two of our volunteers for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. We gave her a certificate, said, called her our guiding light, called her our honorary chairperson. So uh, she was so happy to know that people were taking care of lighthouses. Just a, a wonderful person. So uh, I started Friends of, of, Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse as a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation. I started it in 2001. Uh, and uh, we started having open houses and so forth. But again, it's on an active Coast Guard station. So soon after I started the group, I started hearing stories from the Coast Guard. They're on 24-hour watch much of the year, so they're, they have people there at night and everything. I started hearing these stories. The first story I heard was a woman who worked in the keeper's house on the first floor. She would be there by herself, and she would hear footsteps going back and forth on the second floor. Uh, she would check, and nobody was there, and she was a little a little bit shaken up by that. And I heard the same thing from other people over the years. Um, I also heard uh, stories from Coast Guard who'd be on watch during the night uh, that they would see a woman walking along the wall around the perimeter of the station. They would go out and check and nobody would be there. Sometimes they would see her only on their monitors in the lookout tower uh, and not see her, you know, actually go out, she, they wouldn't see her. Um, one guy was doing the rounds near midnight, walking around the station. He saw a man standing in front of the keeper's house. He got closer and the man disappeared. Uh, there, and this woman I met more recently claimed that she and other, she was there in the 80s, that she and other personnel there kept seeing uh, somebody in an old fashioned military uniform standing in front of the fort on the grounds. So there's, there's so many stories. These stories were kind of mounting up. And we uh, got a New England Ghost Project to come in to do a, an investigation in August 2005. 
Uh, you see Ron Kolick again on the right there, Maureen Wood and Karen Mossy of New England Ghost Project. This is the first time I met any of them. This picture is taken in the watch room at the top of the stairs. You've got a spiral stairway, 44 stairs, then a landing called the watch room, and then a ladder going up into the, the, uh, the lantern room where the light is. Before I play this EVP for you, I want to tell you that about 15 years ago, I was giving a tour for a young couple in that watch room right there. I'm leaning on the ladder talking to this young couple, and in the middle of me talking, I heard, hello, just like that, hello, and I stopped. And to me, it sounded like somebody was at the top of the stairs, a few feet to my right, but there was a wall blocking that area for me. So I, I looked, and there was nobody there. I said to the couple, did you hear something? The guy said, yeah, I heard a man say hello. His wife didn't hear anything. We looked down the stairs. We looked outside. There was nobody in sight anywhere near the lighthouse. Around that same time, one of our volunteers was up painting in the lantern room by himself one day. He was listening to music while he was painting, had headphones on, thought he heard something strange, so he took the headphones off, and he heard, what are you doing? <laughs> so he looked around, nobody around, and he decided it was time to pack up the paint, go home at that point. <laughs> um, my wife was there one time taking Christmas decorations down right where they are, at that port, there were lights around, we had had a Christmas event, there were like lights and decorations around the porthole window you see there. She's taking stuff down, so she's facing that, and she said she heard what sounded like a man right behind her, like right in her ear, and she couldn't make out any words or anything. She said it was like, Arr! like they almost like barked at her or something. And she said she like thinking somebody was right there. She spun around and said, may I help you? And there was nobody there. And again, she looked all, all around. There was no, no sign of anybody. People have heard footsteps on the stairs quite a few times. We've had incidents where the trap door up, up into the lantern seemed to, to move and make a lot of noise by itself and nobody was touching it. Uh, we've had sightings of a man in an old-fashioned keeper's uniform with a white beard out in front of the lighthouse during the day. That's happened a few times. So there's a lot of stories. But I wanted to mention the voice that I heard, hello, because it kind of fits in with the EVPs I'm going to play, because the voice you hear sounds kind of similar. So this first one, this was recorded by Karen Mossy in that watch room. It was after midnight during this investigation in 2005. You're going to hear her voice first say, who's there? And she gets a response. She feels it's saying captain. To me, it sounds kind of quick, like the captain, kind of like that, the captain. Um, it's not a class A EVP. It's not, you know, it's not easily heard as, as captain, but I hope, hope you could hear it that it kind of sounds like that. And that's why I told you the story about Joshua Card liking to be called captain. Is that him? We don't know, but the voice sounds a lot like what I heard. So this one was recorded later. This is uh, uh, Ron Kolek out on the deck at the top of the lighthouse at two in the morning. And you're gonna hear his voice first say, do you like us being here? I think this one's really loud, so. And then he gets an answer. Do you like us being here? Yeah. Sure sounds like yes. Remember I played that once for somebody and they said it sounds like no. I don't know how they got that. It sounds like yes to me. Do you like us being here? And again, it sounds like a similar voice. He's got this older, uh, sort of raspy male voice a lot of times. And this one was recorded just after that by Jim Stonier, who is the uh, EVP person now for New England Ghost Project. So this is out on the deck right after that last one you heard. And he says, I think you should check the light. And he gets a response. I think you should check the light. I think you should check the light. I always like that one because it sounds like there's a pause there, and I always picture Joshua Card like asleep, and he hears, I think you should check the light, and he like wakes up, okay. Um, so. I think you should check the light. I'm going to play you one more EVP recorded by a different group there, Sauhegan Paranormal from Nashua, New Hampshire, in August 2010. You're going to hear a conversation going on in the second floor of the Keeper's House, including me and a few women. Uh, and uh, one of the women says she heard something weird. We're trying to figure out what it was. You're going to hear me say something about I scratch my head. Is that what you heard? Right about then, you hear a weird high-pitched voice that sounds like Mary, Mary. So let me play it. What was that noise? I heard it. My camera is closing. No, it didn't come from me. Yeah. I scratched my head. You didn't hear no, that. no, no, it, that's right. It's more like a 
high pitch. Did you hear when your high pitch noise when it shuts? Here, I'll shut it for you. Could you hear that? People say it sounds like a cat. It's definitely not. Nothing was heard audibly at the time. It was only heard when it was played back. And it really sounds like Mary Mary when you listen closely. Uh, there's theories about that. There was a keeper after Joshua Carr named Henry Cuskley who was there 26 years. He was married to the wife of, I mean, to the daughter of a previous keeper. Um, previous keeper was Leandra White. Leandra White and his wife both died in the keeper's house. Uh, while uh, Henry Cuskley was keeper, living with his, his wife, Leandra White's daughter, if you follow all that. But uh, one theory is that that, that voice is the, uh, the wife of Leandra White, uh, who died in the house, that she's calling out to marry her daughter. Um, but Mary's a common name, so who knows? Um, I just want to say a little bit about Fort Constitution. There's a lot of stories there, too. Uh, very historic fort. has actually been a fort there since the 1630s. The walls you see here, part of the 1808 fort. Uh, and uh, there was never a battle or anyone was killed in the site, but there was an explosion, an accidental explosion on the 4th of July in 1809 that killed 10 people. Eight people instantly died, two more died from their wounds, a lot of people wounded. Some soldiers, during a, during a 4th of July celebration, a couple of the soldiers put some gunpowder out on the grounds to dry in the sun and somehow it ignited. And there was this huge explosion. Um, so, uh, and the, keep the commander's house was badly damaged, et cetera. Uh, these pictures, a lot of people attribute weird happenings in the fort to that explosion. These pictures were taken uh, about 11 o'clock at night during our first ever nighttime event we had there. Uh, this was about 15 years ago. And a woman named Veronica Pollock took these pictures with a little point and shoot digital camera. I'm standing right next to her, right near her when she took the pictures and she said, look what I got here. And so, you know, she didn't have time to go home and Photoshop this or something. It happened right, I saw it happen as it happened, basically. Um, and she couldn't understand what she got here, and I don't have an explanation. Um, it looks like sort of a green light or mist flying through the main entryway to the fort there. You're looking and you've got those weird squiggly lines of light on the left also. This is looking out onto the Coast Guard station. It was late at night. Nothing was going on. Nobody was walking around. There were no cars moving. Nothing, absolutely nothing moving or happening out on the Coast Guard station when these pictures were taken. The picture on the right, some people have pointed out that the light seems to be coming from or leading to the fog bell, the old fog bell from the lighthouse that's on display on the station. You can, it's just around the corner outside the entry to the fort there. So that's an interesting theory that it has something to do with the fog bell. Um, so Salhegan Paranormal uh, came a second time in August 2011. This is out in the, like the middle of the fort. Uh, I guess it might be called the parade ground out in the, the center of the, fort, the grounds of the fort. And this woman in the middle uh, said, I feel something on the back of my neck. And the second she said that, somebody snapped this picture. And this is what they got, this, this ball of light or whatever you want to call it, this weird shape, uh, with some, looks like something coming out of it touching the back of her neck there. And so again, this was taken seconds after, <coughs> seconds after she said something had touched the back of her neck. Uh, I, was, uh, I gave this presentation a, a while back and uh, there was a guy in the audience who uh, was from England, who's written books on the paranormal. He said, let me look at that. And he got up and he looked really closely at that. And he said, that's a moth. He said a moth flew in front of the camera lens and caused that, that image. Uh, the, his idea was the moth is much closer to the lens than the people are. My reaction to what he said was, well, yeah, maybe, I guess. But if, if, uh, if this picture was taken seconds after this woman said, something's touching the back of my neck, if a moth flew in front of the camera to cause this image, right at, what are the chances of that happening right at that moment? It, no matter how you look at this, it's really interesting. Whether it's a moth or something paranormal, uh, it's super interesting as far as I'm concerned. And a lot of, it's been very common. A lot of people have said they felt something touching the back of her neck, their neck in that, that fort. So I got one final story to tell you about Connie Small. I mentioned Elson and Connie Small. He was the last keeper at Portsmouth Harbor Light. They left there in 1948. He died in 1960, and as I mentioned, Connie Small died at 103 in February of 2005. Six months later, New England Coast, Ghost Project did that first ever investigation there in August 05. Uh, about 12.30 a.m., we're up on the second floor of the keeper's house, 
And Maureen Wood, the psychic medium, started saying, oh, there's somebody here. I remember there was something going on. She said, it's very weak. And then she said, oh, there's something stronger. There's a woman. And, uh, and then Maureen seemed to go into a trance the way she does. And she started speaking as if she was somebody else. And she said, in a, like an old woman's kind of haunting, um, halting voice, uh, I want to thank someone. I want to thank someone. And I was standing maybe 10 feet from her. There were a bunch of people crowded in a small area. Ron Kolak was right next to her. And he said, oh, is it me you want to thank? And she said, no. And he said, OK, be that way. Is it Jeremy? Uh, and she said, yes. And she said, I, I want to thank you for the gift. And so I'm, like I said, I'm about maybe 10 feet away from her. And I'm thinking, it actually sounds like Connie. But again, you know, Maureen didn't know anything about any of us, anything about Connie before that night. Um, but another, the skeptical part of me is thinking, no, this is Maureen talking. It's not Connie. But she didn't say much more. She repeated, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the gift. And then after a couple of minutes, she did what she often does in these situations. She collapsed like boom, just fell on the floor like a ton of bricks. The theory, Ron's theory about that is that there's a moment where the spirit leaves Maureen and Maureen is not quite in charge yet. So there's like nobody running the show. And I've seen it happen a number of times where she borderline uh, hurts herself just falling like that. It's kind of scary sometimes, but she was okay. Uh, they helped her downstairs. I stayed upstairs by myself for a few more minutes. And then a few minutes later, a woman who was one of our volunteers came upstairs. Roxy Zwicker, some of you may have heard of her. She's actually written books on the paranormal herself. But she was one of our volunteers at the time. And she was kind of shaken up. And she said to me, you won't believe what Maureen just said to me. Roxy said that Maureen said to her, Connie wants to thank you for the big pink flowers. Now, at Connie's funeral six months earlier, there was an open casket in the front of the church. I was there. Roxy and her husband were there. I was one of the last ones to leave the church, but Roxy and her husband were the last ones to leave. Roxy had a bouquet of pink tulips. The minister said to her, if you want to put those in the casket, go ahead and do that. She did. Nobody else knew that but Roxy and her husband and the minister. Six months later, Maureen Wood, who had never heard of Connie or met any of us before that night, out of the blue said to Roxy, Connie wants to thank you for the big pink flowers. I thought that was pretty interesting. A little, little bit later, uh, uh, Maureen said to me and Roxy together, Connie wants to thank you for being at her funeral. It's the only time I've been told that exactly. But um, you know, does any of this prove anything? No, it doesn't. But I, I kind of left that night feeling more open-minded about all this. It's a little hard to deny all this, really. So it was pretty interesting. So I just want to mention I do a podcast for the U.S. Lighthouse Society, which, of course, is like a radio show you can listen to when you feel like it. If you go to news.uslhs.org, you can listen to it. Or if you have a podcast app on your phone, just search for lighthearted two words, meaning people have lighthouses in their hearts. Uh, and uh, I have done some shows in the paranormal. One of the recent ones was a woman who wrote a book about haunted lighthouses in New Jersey. I've had Ron Kolek on the show talking about the investigations we've done together and so forth. But it's all kinds of subjects related to lighthouses, and I have so much fun doing it. I've done over 200 episodes in almost four years now. So and here's some sources. Um, so I'll stop there, and I thank you very much for your attention today. And I'd be more than happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Yes? Do you have any stories about our twin lights at Thatcher Island? <laughs> That's a really good question. I've been asked that before, and I, the, I wish I did. You would think that they were, there would be stories there. Paul St. Germain, the longtime president of the group there, the Thatcher Island Association, is a good friend. I've asked him about it. He's heard of no stories, uh, surprisingly, because that station goes back to 1771. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, so many people have lived there. They had as many as five keepers and families living on Thatcher Island at one time. So you would think with all that human history, there'd be some stories, but I'm sorry. Maybe I should make one up for the next time somebody asks. But, <laughs> but I haven't heard anything. I can tell you the gulls there are also very loud at night. Yes. You've spent a night there? Uh-huh. As a caretaker or back when they had overnight stays for yeah. the public? Yeah. Camp. Oh, camping, OK. Yeah, there's a, that's right, there's a campground. Um, I, I'll tell you, I was dive-bombed by a black bat gull there. I, won't, I don't want to go into details about that, but it was not pretty. I got too close to its nest, I think. So that was a haunting of a different kind. Anybody else? 
Um, yes. Well, Fort Constitution was originally called Fort William and Mary. Yes. Um, and um, the last time I tried to do a tour there, which was a year ago, the Coast Guard guys uh, had the whole place all locked up and they came out and said they weren't doing yes. tours because of COVID. But I was there and I climbed up to the top about five years ago. I was probably there. I was most likely there. I've been there for most of the tours. Um, I don't know if everybody could hear. She was saying how, first of all, you're absolutely right, of course, it was, uh, it was called Fort Constitution from 1808 on when they rebuilt the fort, but for a long time before that it was Fort William and Mary. It was originally just called the Castle in the really early days, but for a long time it was Fort William and Mary under the British. Um, tremendous history there. But yeah, the station, the Coast Guard station has been completely closed for more than three years now. Not just because of COVID, because uh, the fort is falling apart. And I was there when a woman was nearly killed by falling debris off the fort on her head and her leg. She was, you know, we, we, we thought she was dead at the time, but she, she lived, there's still an ongoing lawsuit related to that. But because of that, it's been closed. Uh, the state, it's owned, the fort is owned by the state of New Hampshire. They're supposedly gonna do repairs by next year and reopen the place, but we'll see what happens. But um, that's the main reason why it was closed. Yeah. Island, which is around here. Well, you, you mean Baker's Island? Baker's Island, is, Baker's Island Lighthouse is considered part of the Misery Islands. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the only lighthouse in that area. Okay. Baker's Island Lighthouse is officially part of Salem, and yes, there are stories about that place. Uh, the Coast Guard keepers and families said that it was quite haunted. I can't really give you any specific stories, although I think it was there where I heard a story about a keeper's wife mm -hmm. reaching into a closet just for some clothes and feeling for sure that there was a person there. It's like she put her hand on a, like a person was standing in the closet and she looked and nobody was there. So that was, that was a good one. But um, I remember a paranormal group went out to investigate Baker's Island and then uh, found out there was no electricity at the light station and they couldn't do their investigation. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Well, Essex Heritage. They own it now. Yeah. They own it and, and you can apply to be the light keeper there. Yeah, that's right. That's a new thing. Yeah. Um, so the lead keepers are like uh, stay like every summer, but they can renew at the end of the summer, and they can yeah. bring their whole family there. And yeah. Everything. Yeah. Thatcher Island does a similar thing. A lot of these organizations, they might call them keepers. I'm more of a purist. A, a keeper to me was somebody hired by the government to actually run the light. The lights are automated now, of course. I would call them caretakers, but they're often referred to as keepers. They do have a great program there. Essex Heritage has done such a great job at that place. I've actually narrated a number of special events for them where the boat will go out and go to the other lighthouses in the area, including Hospital Point here in Beverly, and then land at Baker's Island for a tour. So during summer, you can take a boat out to Baker's Island and tour that, that lighthouse. Same with Thatcher Island. Uh, there's a boat going out from Rockport to Thatcher Island in a couple of days a week in uh, summer. I'd recommend either, either or both of those places very, very highly. It's a nice kayak. Uh-huh, yeah. Anybody who kayaks, that's a good, great destination as well. Yeah, back there. So I understand that you said all the lighthouses are not manned now, they're automatic? Well, we have one that's womaned, as I said, Sally Snowman. She's the only official keeper in the country these days. But yes, the lights that are still active, AC navigation, are all automated now. So we don't have traditional keepers anymore like we once did living at these places. It does. It applies to the whole country. It applies to most of the world. Although Canada, even though all the lights are automated in Canada, they still have more than 50 lighthouse keepers living at places, mainly on the west coast in British Columbia, because they like having people at these, these uh, islands keeping an eye on the harbors and so forth in case people are in trouble. Every year they talk about taking them off and people complain and say you've got to keep them there. So they, they've managed to keep them there so far. But it's the same thing all over the world. There's very few traditional lighthouse keepers in any of the world these days. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah? Um, I don't have a question, but I was just going to mention that if anyone is interested in seeing uh, a Fresnel lens, excuse me, up close, there's uh, one of the Thatcher Island Fresnel lens is, is on permanent exhibit at the Cape Ann Museum. Yes. And it's really pretty fun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In Gloucester, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spoke there right after they put that there. It was pretty neat. Um, it's a, it's like nine feet tall. It's a, yeah, yeah. Um, near closer to where I live, up in Kittery, Maine, there's a second or another set, very similar second order lens from Boone Island Lighthouse on display. It's another place you can see one of those. 
Um, the um, well, Cape Ann Museum also has a smaller one from Eastern Point Lighthouse. It's, sort of, it's a weird, unusual lens. It's like square with the with the prisms on each side. Um, but um, the uh, Maine Lighthouse Museum in Rockland, Maine, has the country's largest collection of Fresnel Lighthouse lenses. So if you're ever up in Midcoast, Maine, go to the Maine Lighthouse Museum. It's amazing. Oh, I didn't know that. There's a museum in Scotland has the biggest collection in the world. I interviewed them for my podcast not too long ago. What yeah, the, the museum, the national, the um, uh, lighthouse, what is the official name of it? The Museum of Scottish Lighthouses in... Uh, Edinburgh? No, no, it's, it's quite north of there. Uh, as soon as I stop trying to think of it, I'll think of the name of the town. But it's, it's at a lighthouse, um, and I can't think of the name of the lighthouse or the town. Again, the shore, yeah, it's up in the, it's, it's uh, well, it starts with Dundee, Dundee, yeah. Yeah. That's where it is, There's yeah. The fort. Yeah, that's where the lighthouse and museum are, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, anybody else, any questions? Well, again, thank you so much. And I will mention that I have some books up here if anybody's interested. The books are from 10 to $20. I have my Lighthouse Handbook, New England, my bestseller. It's a guide to every lighthouse in New England. I haven't written a book on lighthouse ghost stories yet, although I've certainly thought about it over the years. But there's, go there's ghost stories woven into a lot of my books. <laughs>